All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our wonderful panel that we have today. This is our press briefing on the overhaul to take human occupied vehicle Alvin to greater extremes. I'm Lauren Lacuma from the AGU Media Relations Office and I'll be moderating today's panel. So our panelists today are Chad King from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Anna Louise Reisenbach from Portland State University, Adam Sewell from Woods Hole and Bruce Strickrod also from Woods Hole. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. The slides from this presentation will be available in the Fall Meeting Media Center. And this briefing will be recorded and the recording will be posted to AGU's YouTube channel. Um, and it will be available later this afternoon. Um, and the links to both of those websites um, will be put in the chat by my colleague, Liza Lester. And then after the formal briefing ends, we're gonna open up an informal 30 minute discussion room via Zoom, just to give you an additional opportunity to chat with the panelists face-to-face -face, virtually um, and the link to that discussion room will also be posted in the chat box. And the passcode is AGU Press, all lowercase. And if you have any questions at any time or, que or trouble connecting, um, email us at news at agu.org and we'll get to you as soon as we can. And so with that, I will turn it over to our panelists. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Bruce Strickrott with Woods Hole Geographic Institution. I'm the uh, manager and chief pilot of the DSV Alvin program here at Woods Hole. Can you go to the next slide, please? And uh, I've had great fortune in being a part of the program, the Alvin program for going on 25 years now. And uh, it's been an amazing experience and we're really excited about what's going on with the vehicle. Uh, just to give you a little heads up, it's here at Woods Hole, it's completely disassembled, but by spring of, of the next year, we'll have it all back together again, effectively brand new. And, you, and we'll talk about that briefly here for a few minutes. You can go to the next slide. A little history on Alvin. It's been around since 1964. This image shows the commissioning here on the dock at Woods Hole back in June of 1964. And uh, it started with the concept of taking a machine and building it such that people could go down in the bottom of the ocean and see things that no one had ever seen and discover things that no one had ever discovered. And at the time they had great vision. And I'd like to say that based on where we are today, uh, that vision has been uh, more than met. And in fact, I'd love to go back and speak to the folks that started it all and uh, share with them what they've created. Please go to the next slide. And speaking of one of those people I would, would love to go speak to, this is Dr. Alan Vine. Young Allen Vine on the left doing geology on the research vessel Atlantis, which was a sailing ship at the time. Uh, Dr. Vine was quoted as saying, it's very difficult to design an instrument that can be surprised. And, and I love this quote. I think it's, it's really applicable to what we do in the vehicle, three people, three brains, six eyes, and an amazing machine. And surprise is a critical aspect of the discoveries that we make down there. And we see it on a routine basis watching a new scientist in the sub uh, first time on the bottom be surprised and make new connections between their, 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 what they're seeing and what they're learning and studying is, is really an amazing experience and underscores the strength of being underwater uh, with, with people. Please go to the next slide. Uh, one of the hallmarks of Alvin is its continuing evolution in design and capability. This graphic is really great because it shows the early version of Alvin and, and it was very effective at the time. The technology was all brand brand new and, and a lot of the things that we can do today didn't even exist at the time. And over the years, Alvin has evolved to meet the needs of the science users and also has driven the science technology and then incorporated technologies that have come along in things like sensing and navigation and imaging. And the, the sub is then upgraded and it, it's a cycle where we reinforce new science and science reinforces the new technology. Uh, it's and it's a wonderful thing to be a part of as one of the engineers and pilots. Go to the next slide, please. Back in May of 2013, we completed a one and a half, two year overhaul of the sub that included many new systems like this brand new hull and interior. You see the interior on the left and about 70% uh, of the sub was improved and, and made ready for 6,500 meter operations. Uh, go to the next slide, please. We brought it out in 2013, 
did over 400 dives. And then in March of 2020, after our very last dive on March 11th of 2020, we brought Alvin here and began the disassembly in earnest to, uh, to integrate the final systems to take it deeper. And uh, there are quite a, quite a few of these. This is a good shot of the sub here in the high bay uh, at Woods Hole in, in disassembly. Go to the next slide, please. And we will complete these system upgrades uh, with the plan to take it out for sea trials in summer of 2021, followed by our first science verification expedition. And a number of things we're doing with the sub besides the, the improvements to take it deeper, which are sort of subtle, many systems upgrades on, uh, on our science interface and our imaging 4K ultra high definition and ergonomics on the inside to deal with those images, still imaging, uh, light placement, the ability to really collect sensor data. Uh, the bow system is new, will increase the payload on the sub. Brand new thrusters will make the sub more maneuverable. A command and control system will will make it maneuver even more precisely. Uh, lots of new data interfaces and uh, the way that we handle data in and out of the sub and the amount of data that we can, we can work with. And one of the things we're planning is the ability to send metadata from the sub and images up to the surface. So it's gonna be quite an exciting time to get new folks back in the sub and, and actually do what we do in this picture, which is give them the controls for a few minutes and let them fly around and, and see what's down there. Go to the next slide. So again, uh, the new we call it new state-of-the-art submersible. The program is over 56 years old. Uh, the experience that Woods Hole and uh, the Alvin team and the other engineers here at Woods Hole and the scientists here at Woods Hole bring to the the program and what we could offer with a brand new submarine is uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, I'd like to say that. Uh, the great support of the National Science Foundation, the Office of Naval Research that owns uh, Alvin and oversees our maintenance operations, and, uh, and, and the support of NOAA have made a big difference over the years for the program. Uh, great Vision has kept it going for 56 years, and with the, the improvements we've made, we, we fully anticipate Alvin to continue on for another 40 or 50 years easily. Uh, providing great service to scientists and uh, offering new users opportunities to go down to the bottom of the ocean and see amazing places and discover new and amazing things. Please go to the next slide. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you and I'll turn it over to uh, Anna Louise Reisenbach. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh chair of the Deep Submergent Science Committee um, and a, a professor at Portland State University. Next slide, please. So to be preemptive and nimble to Alvin's coming out of overhaul in 2021, together with Adam Sewell, we reached out to the scientific community for input on firstly, what are some of the critical outstanding interdisciplinary research questions in the abyss? And then what will some of the science needs be for the Alvin verification expedition, which Adam will talk about later. So this input was first in, in the form of a survey where we got about 200 respondents from 35 states, as well as some international input. We use this to inform a series of four workshops, which were held online and funded by the National Science Foundation. Each of, the th each of three of the workshops um, had four pre-recorded talks that participants watched beforehand, and they provided fodder for the online breakout discussions. All these very valuable materials are available on the website listed here in, in this slide. Um, so please go and look, look it up. Uh, the four workshops, workshop topics discussed were um, basically abyssal plains and seamounts, and much of the abyss is abyssal plains, trenches and transform faults, technological challenges and societal relevance for studying the abyss. And then the fourth one was on diversity, equity, and inclusion in deep sea science. And we're currently writing up these findings and recommendations of the workshop. 
Next slide, please. So I will briefly highlight some of the common themes that resulted from, from these very dis stimulating discussions at these meetings. One of the things that became quickly clear is that our knowledge of the abyssal geological, chemical and biological interconnectivity is extremely limited. We immediately recognized we had have very little fundamental baseline data. Like we don't have really good detailed maps. Having good maps would help better define things like geological geochemical transition zones that may have impact on biology, but would also be important for things like geohazard detection and prediction. Um, we also have very little understanding of the extent and both biological and geological importance of recently discovered features such as petite spots. We have very limited information of the impact that transform faults may have on fluid flow and hence the potential of these features for supporting life. And of course, in the abyss, pressure is extremely important because it's so deep. And so studying the impacts of, of pressure on fluid chemistry and biology is really important too. Um, and finally, we have very little understanding of the actual connectivity of the abyss with the rest of the ocean. So there are lots, myriad of questions we could be asking um, related to that. So just, for, just by example, next slide, please. Um, we lack fundamental knowledge of the biodiversity in the abyss. And I'm a biologist, so that's why I'm focusing on this. It has been shown that biological distribution is very patchy and heterogeneous, heterogeneous but, own, but and also that over 70% of what has been collected from the abyss has never been described. Because life in the abyss occurs generally at very slow rates, it's cold down there, it is extremely sensitive to human impacts, which leads me to the next slide, considering what the societal and environmental importance is of studying the abyss. So for example, sessile fauna generally like to attach to hard surfaces and much of the mineral rich deposits like ferromanganese and cobalt crusts in the abyss are rich oases for attachment of biology. So seafloor sea mining of these will likely have a significant impact on the stability of the biological communities. Furthermore, we, we don't understand the extent of pollution from things like microplastics or just dumping trash in the abyss. None of that is well documented. And without a baseline understanding of the abyss, it too is threatened by the effects of global warming. More broadly though, there are other cold planets in the solar system. And so studying our abyss helps inform us what is important elsewhere or what is possible elsewhere. Next slide, please. So to address the myriad of questions we synthesized in this workshop, it is clear that studies of the abyss will, at many will be at many different scales from real broad scale to local case studies, temporal studies and using observatory type approaches. So in next slide please, thank you. In order to uh, accomplish these research goals, there are many technological innovations required for success, such as pressure tolerance and miniaturization of research tools developed and the development of new sensors. So all of this requires access to the deep ocean. And so the new Alvin will be added to the Abyss research toolbox. And so we're excited about seeing this happen. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Chad King, and I am a biologist from Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I'm going to talk a little bit today about my experience in diving uh, in the Alvin in 2019. Next slide, please. So just as a quick background, uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is a federally 
a marine protected area. It was established in 1992. It's quite large, uh, incorporating much of the central coast of California, about 6,000 square miles, a lot of shoreline, and it can get over two miles deep in its deepest areas. In 2008, uh, we did add uh, a box there in the lower part of the screen around Davidson Seamount, which is an extinct volcano, and that's what I'm going to highlight today. Next slide, please. So Davidson Seamount is one of the largest seamounts along the west coast of the U.S. It can fit in Monterey Bay, basically from Monterey to Santa Cruz. It's 26 miles long. Uh, it's eight miles wide, but it's actually quite high. It's about as high as Donner Summit in the Sierras, about seven plus thousand feet. However, it's still about 4,000 feet below the ocean's surface, so it's in perpetual darkness. But it is an extinct volcano. It last erupted almost 10 million years ago. Uh, even, even though it's considered one of the best studied seamounts in the world, that's just a relative measure because we still have barely seen a, uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg for this, this seamount. Next slide, please. So in a, uh, around 2000, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and uh, our sanctuary went out on a few expeditions from 2000 to 2006 and really uh, just discovered an incredible assortment of these long lived corals and sponges out there. It was a veritable Dr. Seuss land of colors and it's considered the oasis in the deep or an oasis in the deep, uh, just an incredibly important area. And it's, it was the discoveries of these corals and special species that led to the inclusion or the addition of Davidson Seamount to the sanctuary. Next uh, slide, please. So in 2018, we had the opportunity to go out uh, with a couple of ROVs from Ocean Exploration Trust and look at areas what I guess you would consider in the foothills of Davidson Seamount. We had seen quite a bit on the summit and slopes of the volcano, but we wanted to see what was on all of these little rocky reefs around the seamount. Uh, even though our purpose was to go and document corals and sponges in those areas, because it's in our charter for our sanctuary to do so, we ran across something pretty spectacular. And this is a picture here of these little softball look, looking creatures. These are all octopus in this very unique position. This is actually a brooding posture for this species of octopus. And brooding, that's basically just taking care of their eggs, which they cement to the rocks below them. They basically uh, sit on them kind of like a bird on a nest, but upside down. It's a very unusual posture. So we discovered uh, a couple thousand of these mother octopuses and they were all grouped in these pools and lines. You can go to the next slide, please. And it was very odd that they were uh, arranged in these very linear uh, uh, formations. It was quite incredible. And so we saw some shimmering coming out of these cracks and pools in the seafloor. So it it's much like on a hot summer day when you look at pavement and you see that shimmering air waves coming up. It's the you know, refraction of, of, of the light as the heat dissipates from the pavement. So we thought maybe it was warm. However, we did not get a chance to measure the temperature. We weren't able to dive further during this expedition. Next slide, please. And that brings me to a BBC special that was uh, broadcast last March of 2019 called Blue Planet Live. And they broadcast from several areas around the globe. And one of the areas they wanted to broadcast from was this octopus garden. And so that's where the Alvin steps in. And we had this just incredible opportunity to revisit it for the first time. Next slide, please. So it's actually quite far off the seamount, a, a couple of miles there circled in uh, red. It's just a little bump on the seafloor, very innocuous. Next slide, please. So here we have, it's probably a, a two minute video or, or so. I hope that you guys will be able to see this if the resolution is good enough. But these are video clips actually from the Alvin itself. And in a couple of these clips, you'll be able to see hopefully this shimmering, this waving video, and that is the warm water coming out. Now with the Alvin, we were able to actually measure the temperature of this water for the first time. And we did confirm it was warm water coming out, which was another shocking new discovery. It never, no one ever assumed there was warm water coming out of this volcanic rock, uh, even by a geologist at uh, Imbari. That was a picture of the temperature wand going in. With the Alvin, we also discovered uh, additional pockets of hundreds of these octopus around. This one we called the octopus spa because it kind of looked like all the octopus were we're sitting in a spa, uh, but we certainly uh, uh, enlarged, I guess, the area of, of exploration here. 
And I got to tell you, diving with the Alvin um, is something that I never thought I was going to be able to do in my career. It's something that I've known since I was a child, and it was just an incredible opportunity to do so. Here's some great video of these octopus mothers taking care of their eggs. And this is a first that you'll see right here. During this dive, and I was with Bruce, by the way, who just spoke to you. If you see on the, the left side there, it'll replay a second time here. We documented the first hatching of these baby octopus here. So we knew it was a viable nursery. This is only the second such nursery discovered in the world. And the other one, which is off the coast of Costa Rica, uh, is not deemed viable. They have not seen any proof or, or evidence of any of the eggs being able to develop. So it was just an incredible dive. We discovered so much in just one day. Uh, and we also did a, a second dive at, at Davidson Seamount Summit to look at corals and sponges. And I'll show you that in just a second. Next slide, please. So this is just some imagery of these baby octopus hatching. We actually saw several of them and, and Bruce and I got pretty giddy in the sub. And, and uh, when we were measuring temperatures, it was kind of like, uh, you know, the price is right. We were guessing what temperature we could, uh, we could get, how high we could get. And we did get as high as I believe uh, seven and a half degrees Celsius uh, that day. Uh, next slide, please. And by the way, ambient temperatures near freezing at 1.8. So even though it's still relatively cold to us, it's relatively warm to them. Next slide, please. So the other dive that we did was to the summit of Davidson Seamount. Here's a couple of frame grabs from these large bubblegum corals called Paragorgia down there. Now I've been looking at these things for 20 years, but they're always on a two-dimensional flat screen. And even though I know the size of the, the sizes of these corals can reach up to three meters wide and three meters tall, so 10 feet tall, you see it in two dimensions. There's really not uh, uh, an effective scale. When we parked the Alvin below these coral trees, it was incredible to be looking out of the porthole up at these things. And diving the Alvin really gives biologists and researchers and geologists, anyone diving, a completely new perspective on the landscape or the bathyscape down there. And it really gave me an, a new appreciation for what it really looks like down there. You can see angles, perspective, topography, things that you just cannot get with a two-dimensional camera. Next slide, please. So this was incredible because one of the things that uh, Woods Hole and, and others were asking me was, do you think the octopus will still be there? We had seen them for an hour in October of 2018 and I couldn't guarantee they would be there. Uh, and they were pouring all these resources in there. Uh, uh, a scientist extended their crews by four days to allow this to happen. BBC flew out there. It was an incredible um, network of, of choreography between all of these institutions. But those, uh, that second visit really allowed and propelled future work again with Mbari and Ocean Exploration Trust to go back out there repeatedly to find more of these octopus. And serendipitously, we came across this whale fall here, which is essentially a a whale who died at the surface or that died at the surface and then sunk to the bottom. It was relatively fresh. And uh, this has led to so many other discoveries, including a new species of bone-eating worm and many other things. So I just want to wrap a bow on this saying that, you know, not only exploration is important because you don't know what you're going to find out there. And I'm really, really happy that Alvin is being upgraded to 6,500 meters because it's going to be able to explore most of the world's oceans. And these are the kind of discoveries that come from pushing the boundaries for depth and geography. And I just want to thank uh, uh, Bruce and Ken and others at HUI for making this happen. Uh, it's been an incredible experience and it's really changed my career in terms of what I've pivoted to start studying now. Uh, primarily, I was a kelp forest ecology guy, had been working in the deep sea for the last 15 to 20 years, but this has really opened a, a new avenue to an incredible uh, a line of uh, exploration and new science. So I want to thank you for uh, being able to speak to today. Great. Uh, that, was, that was awesome, Chad. This goes against my policy of ever following a presentation that has baby octopus being born uh, but if you can redirect your attention for a few minutes, I'm going to wrap up and provide some uh, kind of broader context for this upgrade and what it's going to mean for deep sea science. Uh, my name is Adam Sewell. I'm the chief scientist for deep submergence at HUI. It's in that role I provide uh, kind of scientific guidance for the Alvin program and the other vehicles in the National Deep Submergence Facility and interface with the uh, community of users. I'm also an active user of Alvin for my own marine geology research. Uh, next slide. 
As you've gathered, the, the completion of this upgrade is going to bring Alvin's depth rating to 6,500 meters, and that's 2,000 meters beyond its current rating. This brings Alvin's depth capabilities in line with the deepest diving uh, human-occupied research submersibles in the world, save for China's brand new full ocean depth Fendouge. Um, next slide, if you if you can. What makes this depth increase particularly exciting, though, is that Alvin is far and away the most proven and productive um, human-occupied submersible in in the in the kind of world. It's 5,065 dives uh, are more than all of the other world's deep diving research submersibles combined, and equates to around uh, or more than 100 dives per year in service. So quite simply, this upgrade uh, is going to bring more researchers to the deepest parts of the ocean than ever before, and, uh, and we hope supercharge the, the pace of discovery in, and research in the abyssal to hadal depth regions. Next slide. Now it's somewhat surprising what this 2000 meter depth increase means for where Alvin can dive. Its previous depth uh, range of 4,500 meters, uh, it allows Alvin to work in, in more than, or in around 70% of the world's oceans, but its new depth rating of just 2,000 more meters is going to, going to open up a third more of the ocean uh, for, for research, leaving less than 1% of the ocean inaccessible to Alvin. If you can go to the next slide. This is a slide that Anna Louise showed earlier. It highlights the new, uh, newly available or accessible places in the ocean between 4,500 and, and 6,500 meters depth. Included within that are areas that are um, really important both scientifically and societally. Uh, Anna Louise mentioned uh, ferromanganese deposits. Well, the, the ones that have been actively leased by nation states, uh, in particular the Clarion Clipperton zone, is within this depth range just to the southeast of Hawaii. Also uh, accessible are the upper reaches of some of the deepest uh, subduction trenches on the planet, the deepest mid-ocean ridges, and with them the highest temperature hydrothermal vents that have ever been measured, and transform faults that cleave the ocean crust and expose the Earth's interior at the seafloor. As Dr. Reisenbach noted, our knowledge uh, in this abyssal zone is minimal, and we can almost count on the uh, discoveries of novel species and new processes each time we venture to these uh, newly accessible depths. Next slide. An important question to ask is who is going to make these discoveries? There's an established community of researchers who have and will continue to use Alvin, but it's important to note that Alvin is really a tool for anyone with a research question that needs access to the deep ocean. Collectively, the deep submergence um, community, both the, the scientists, the operators, and the sponsors have worked hard to develop training programs, both onshore and at sea, to ensure that early career researchers and anyone uh, outside of the established user community view Alvin as a tool that they can use. And we've been pretty successful in that effort. To put this in perspective, I'll make the comparison to NASA's astronaut program. This comparison is often made because uh, both programs are taking humans to frontier regions that uh, have never been visited before. Over the years, about 350 US astronauts have gone beyond low Earth orbit. But in the six years since Alvin's last overhaul, an equal number of scientists have made their first dive to the seafloor. That's really uh, uh, gratifying for, for us as operators and a community to know that this new generation of scientists are getting in the sub and, and um, learning how to use it as a tool for research. Over its lifetime, Alvin has brought thousands of scientists and engineers to the deep sea to use what are our greatest tools, our eyes and our brains to advance knowledge. Next slide. So as the overhaul uh, is completed, I wanted to talk about what the next steps are going to be. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen is that Alvin is going to conduct certification dives in cooperation with the Navy that are going to um, certify the sub for operations at its maximum depth of 6,500 meters. 
Following that, the National Science Foundation will sponsor a science verification expedition where a group of volunteer scientists, including uh, experienced and established Alvin users and new users, will run Alvin through its paces, testing, for example, uh, new imaging systems, science interface systems, and even how we conduct dives at these depths where we're gonna take more time to descend and ascend. The first of the, these dives are planned for the Puerto Rico Trench. This is a subduction zone uh, that extends to more than 8,000 meters depth. I want to mention one of the new users who's involved uh, uh, in this program, uh, who is uh, Rosa Leon Zayas. She's an assistant professor at Willamette University uh, who has never been in uh, Alvin before, but studies hadal microbiology. She is originally from Puerto Rico uh, and has volunteered to help us integrate Puerto Rican scientists into the project so that they can access the incredible deep sea that's in their own backyards. Uh, next slide. After the Puerto Rico Trench, we're gonna move dive operations to the Mid Cayman Spreading Center. This is one of the deepest spreading centers uh, on the planet and hosts the hottest hydrothermal vent fluids ever recorded at over 400 degrees centigrade. Participating in this program will be Dr. Emily Chin. She's an assistant professor at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She also has never had a dive in Alvin before, but uh, Emily studies um, the Earth's interior through bits of the mantle that come up through volcanoes. And in this particular spreading center, because it is spreading so slowly, Deep, uh, pen deeply penetrating faults are bringing those mantle rocks up to the seafloor. So it's gonna give Emily a, a new access to the, to the samples she needs to, to do her research. Uh, next slide. Right, so that kind of wraps up the presentation uh, portion of, of this briefing. And I think that uh, the next steps of maybe Warren will help us is to open the floor up for questions. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, panelists. That was really wonderful. Um, so now we're going to open up the floor to questions and reporters can type their questions in at any time. And um, Liza Lester, my colleague, will ask them on your behalf. And just please remember to state your full name and affiliation when asking your question. Do we have any already in the queue, Liza? Well, we had one that got an answer by text, but maybe while folks are thinking up their questions, we'll just go ahead and, and ask and answer that one again. Does that sound good? So okay. Harvey Leifert, a freelancer, asks, is Alvin an acronym or is it named for someone? Uh, hey, this is Bruce Strickland. I'll take that one. Uh, Alvin is an acronym uh, named for Alan Vine. So it's both. It, uh, Alan Vine was given a fair amount of credit for getting the program going. And that's how Alvin got its great iconic name, Al Vine, Alvin. Great. Well, let's give, we'll give everyone a minute or two to think up some questions or type them into the box. Is there anything else the panelists want to mention? Yeah, I, I would highlight again that, um, you know, as Anna Louise mentioned in our workshop, we spent a fair bit of time talking about um, how the deep sea, which is, is really removed from, from us on land, uh, actually has a fairly significant impact on um, people. And uh, both, as Anna Louise mentioned, the, the potential impacts of C4 mining, uh, climate change, um, pollution, that in order to uh, understand what those impacts are, we need to go there and, and collect the data. And I think we're in a uh, actually a pretty fortunate position. This is an area that hasn't uh, uh, that, that we have yet to impact. And so we have the opportunity to learn a great deal about it uh, before we start uh, to kind of have our way with it. And that's a, a, a great thing. And, and Alvin's gonna be an excellent tool for, for doing that. All right, we have a question here in the box. Laura Trethway, a freelancer asks, when are these upcoming expeditions taking place? Adam, I'll take the first half of that question. The uh... The first thing we need to do once we get the sub back together, this is Bruce Strickrod again, is uh, have the Navy come and watch us dive it progressively deeper to 6,500 meters. And that's scheduled for uh, 
for August and into September of 2021. And then immediately following will be what Adam will describe, which is our next mission, our first science mission. Yeah, and so, so um, following those certification dives, we're going to have this science verification expedition. It's gonna follow directly on those certification dives and last for a period of two to three weeks before Alvin goes right back into service uh, for science programs. And one of the things that's controlling the timing of, of these is that Alvin's uh, support ship, uh, uh, research vessel Atlantis is currently also undergoing an overhaul, a midlife refit, uh, and it's in the shipyard right now, and it's gonna come uh, on the West Coast, it's gonna come through the canal, uh, pick up Alvin in, in late summer, early fall of next year. I'd like to add one thing about that, uh, Adam, is uh, while we're operating Alvin off the ship, the ship in and of itself is an amazing platform for science. So it's an incredible, incredible uh, machine full of uh, sensors and technology that we can use. And it's effectively a 24 hour scientific operation, uh, day and night work going on whenever we're out on site. So it's, it's an amazing place to be working. And it's also a very uh, effective uh, operation for, for gaining new research. Thanks everyone. Uh, last call for questions. Any more questions from the reporters in the audience? So there's a question in the chat box. I see it. So Laura follows up with, how are you conducting science dives in the meantime? Uh, Adam, why don't you handle that one? Because there, there are dives happening, but not with Alvin. Yeah, right. So uh, Alvin is part of a, a suite of tools that the US research community uses to access the ocean's interior. Uh, it is unique amongst them in, in that it is the only human occupied submersible that's really active right now. Uh, but a lot of dives uh, and research are being conducted with robotic vehicles. So uh, remotely operated vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles. And so the, the research community and, and our facility at, at Woods Hole is using uh, ROV JSON and AUV Sentry to, to continue conducting research in the oceans, as well as a number of other operators. Um, the remotely operated vehicle, Jason, also has a capability of diving to 6,500 meters. Uh, and I think I would, I would just say that there's a, um, a great deal of demand for all of these research uh, uh, vehicles uh, to, to do work. And so having Alvin um, out of service makes makes it a little tough, but when it comes back into service, we're excited that it just allows more and more research to be uh, conducted in the oceans. I wanted to if add while while folks are still listening to some of the kind of new uh, technologies that are being added to the sub, and, and uh, Bruce mentioned the. Uh, new imaging systems, and that's one of the kind of critical data sets that's collected by uh, the vehicle is, is the imagery that we can then use to share with uh, colleagues and with the public. Um, Bruce mentioned that there is going to be a new technology to allow um, imagery and data from the sub to come acoustically through the water up to the ship. And that's going to be really important because in a vehicle like Alvin, you have three are two scientists and a pilot down there making decisions. And sometimes you encounter things. And in fact, most of the time you encounter things that are beyond the expertise of the folks who are there. So the ability to send an image up of, uh, you know, a bubblegum coral to Chad and he can say, yeah, that's, a, that's really cool. Let's get a sample or take some images. Uh, it's gonna be a really nice addition for, for the sub. Laura asks, can you talk about the differences between China's new Fendiza and 
Alvin, specifically why it can go so much deeper? Uh, I'll feel this one. The, the answer is what I do know about the machine. It's, um, it's impressive. I've looked at it and uh, um, I have great regard for, for the vision they have to go deep. Uh, it all comes down to physics. We made uh, the we queried the, the community when uh, Alvin was going to be upgraded to 4,500 meters, and we built some design constraints around the size of the vehicle, our ability to handle it with the current launching mechanism, and to to operate it off of the Atlantis, and uh, where we wanted to go based on that uh, graph that you saw earlier, and the decision was uh, to go to 6,500 meters. We felt it was the most practical one. So. The differences between taking it deeper really come down to uh, the hull thickness and the interior di usable diameter. So I suspect it's quite a bit tighter inside the hull than it is in Alvin, which actually got larger. Uh, but most of the technologies that are used to take uh, Fender J to 10,000 meters are very similar to what we use to take Alvin to 6,500 meters. So it's, there isn't any any grand technological differences. I think mostly we made uh, good practical decisions uh, and and also size. I believe Venduje is a, a fair bit larger and heavier than, than Alvin. And the, uh, one of the other things is to make maximum use of bottom time. And we'll be able to get down and do a fair bit of time down on the bottom at 6,500 meters. Adam, you might add to that because you were part of the whole process too. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Bruce is exactly right about, about um, vehicles that can go deeper generally are going to have to get larger, both in the sense that you need a thicker and heavier uh, personnel sphere, but you also need to add the flotation uh, that can that can uh, raise that back up after after you're done working, and uh, and so there are some probably differences in size and it and just to uh, kind of highlight what Bruce said, the, the amount of time you can spend on the bottom uh, is, is important. And what we don't know about Fenduge uh, is what sort of battery technologies that they're using. Um, I think that, you know, we are continuing to use what's the very safe uh, lead acid batteries. Uh, but I think in the next decade, what you're going to see is, is uh, uh, movement towards um, newer battery technologies once the kind of safety factor gets to where we would need it to be. And that's going to, uh, you know, open up some new opportunities for how long you can stay on the bottom, how fast you can move around and what you can do when you're down there. All right, well, we're just about 145 and we're, we have no more open questions. So at this point, we'll conclude, and but we will still open up that informal discussion room via Zoom meetings. If anyone wants to join us and talk a little bit more with the panelists face-to-face um, -face virtually. So um, the link to the discussion room is in the chat. So you can go ahead and join at any time and, and we'll conclude our briefing now. Thank you all for joining us.